Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to The Authority. I'm Joseph Pierce, and the author whose authority we are looking at this uh, time is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, the great um, uh, collaborator with uh, William Wordsworth, who was the uh, the uh, the authority last time. So Wordsworth and Coleridge together, as we saw, were collaborators in the very important volume, Lyrical Ballads, uh, published in 1798, which was the launching pad for the uh, Romantic movement in England, which led to the Catholic and Christian literary revival. Uh, which we discussed at, at greater length um, uh, earlier, so I, I won't go over that so much this time, except just to remember the importance of these two poets in that regard. So lyrical ballads uh, included poems by both uh, poets. Probably the best known poem by Coleridge from lyrical ballads is the long poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And the first thing about that is that... Um, uh, it's profoundly Christian. So Coleridge, like uh, Wordsworth, recoiled from the horrors of the secularism and atheism of the French Revolution back towards uh, an embrace of Christianity. Uh, generally speaking, by the way, that as regards English history, the French Revolution had quite a positive uh, impact because uh, they were, uh, the, the English were horrified by that proto-communist revolution just across the channel in France, uh, and it softened the attitude of the English aristocracy and the English governing class towards Catholicism. They were very uh, allowed uh, thousands of uh, emigres, refugees from the revolution, French refugees to come to England, including hundreds of priests and nuns and monks, uh, and so the Catholic presence in the country increased manifold um, as a direct consequence of the revolution and the attitude towards Catholicism softened because they saw the way that the Catholic Church was being persecuted by these uh, atheists, uh, uh, revolutionaries in France. So Wordsworth and Coleridge were indicative of this tra change of mood, this, uh, this uh, re-embrace of Christianity as the only sane alternative to the madness of revolution. Uh, and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, it was written in archaic English. So if it reads ar archaically now, it's not surprising because it read archaically then. So part of the device that Coleridge was using in that poem was to evoke the past. We talked about how romanticism led to neo-medievalism. Uh, this is uh, a poem that, that, that has that ambiance that feel of uh, of of being old and antiquated and and the use of uh, archaic english is one of the means by which that's that's done the ancient mariner uh, is someone who has a story to tell and the story to tell is a cautionary tale of the dangers of breaking taboos and i'll talk that talk about that in a moment the Christian dimension is, is emphasized by the fact that the person to whom the story is told is the wedding guest. And of course, we uh, the wedding guest is one who's invited to the wedding at which the bridegroom uh, is to be found. And the bridegroom, of course, is Christ. So there's a whole biblical um, allegorical dimension to the poem. And in that sense, in some sense, the albatross can be seen uh, as sin. Uh, and the wearing of the albatross around the neck as the carrying of the cross. So, uh, but what the albatross is, the, the killing of the albatross, the ancient mariner breaks the taboo that all is going well until he recklessly, out of a sin of just reckless pride, shoots and kills the albatross. 
So what is the albatross? I said it's a taboo. Uh, in his famous lecture or essay on fairy stories, uh, J.R.R. Talk, Tolkien talks about the, um, the importance of prohibition, uh, thou shalt not, uh, throughout uh, the story of humanity. The most famous, of course, is... Uh, um, not not just the thou shalt not uh, as regards the Ten Commandments, but more importantly, thou shalt not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Uh, that 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 the taboo being that, that that the fruit from the tree should not be plucked and consumed, and it was the breaking of that taboo which brought about our downfall. We see in other forms, in other stories. Perhaps another famous one would be Pandora's box that she was told that on, on no account open the box, but she allowed her curiosity to get the better of her, open the box, and all of the sins and pestilences that plague humanity escaped in consequence with only hope left remaining in the box. The only thing left was hope because of uh, the pestilence unleashed. So the importance of the taboo, and we sort of live in an age which uh, the only taboo is the taboo itself, that nothing is taboo, so to speak. And yet, if you want a healthy society, you have to accept there are certain things that should not be uh, permitted, that should be taboo. I'm not going to talk in specific terms about what that might be in our own culture. I think most of us will have a pretty good idea or inkling. But the point of the poem is ultimately uh, similar to what we saw in some of Wordsworth's poems about the necessity of what Alexander Solzhenitsyn would call self-limitation. We have to voluntarily self-limit. If we don't voluntarily self-limit, we will be involuntarily limited by others or by ourselves, in fact, either through addiction to sin, that's the invo in, in, involuntary um, limitation of the self, um, the, the becoming an addict, to, to, to bad practices. But the other thing is the complete absence of self-limitation, where we will not have virtue, uh, where viciousness, viciousness prevails, will have collapse. And what follows on from collapse following anarchy is tyranny. So if you will not have self-limitation, you will have slavery. Um, there is no middle path. So basically, the message of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is exactly that, that you, you, you do not uh, do the taboo thing uh, if you do not want to face the consequences of so doing. Okay, I want to now move on to what I think is one of the most beautiful poems ever written in the English language, and that's uh, uh, Coleridge's Hymn Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix. And we can't read all of it, unfortunately, uh, although I'd like to because it's quite long. Um, but I, I would like to focus on it for a large part of, 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 of this episode of The Authority. So uh, we, we spoke uh, last time when we were discussing Wordsworth about what I call the five metaphysical senses. Uh, and I shall reiterate those now, because not least because it's true of everything, uh, true of your own uh, relationship with reality. Uh, that pride, as the great philosopher Jane Austen reminds us, is always married to prejudice. Pride and prejudice go together. If you have a prejudiced per perception, you're not seeing things as they are, you're seeing them uh, in the uh, way that your prideful prejudice uh, presents them to you. If you want to see things as they are, you have to get on your knees. Pride is the absence of humility. If you have humility, you will have a sense of gratitude. You have a sense of gratitude, you'll see with eyes wide open in wonder. And then you'll be moved to contemplation. And that leads to the dilation, the dilatatio, dilatatio, the, the opening of the mind and the soul into the fullness of reality. This is what happens in this poem. So just to... to, to, to um, set the scene uh the poet is in the vale of chamonix so in the alps uh in europe and he's looking at mont blanc i don't know if that's the highest mountain of the alps if it's not the highest it's certainly almost the highest um certainly one of the most famous and most beautiful and it's not yet daylight and what he's about to experience as he looks at the mountain the majesty of the the, the, the mountain is the mountain being transfigured by the rising of the sun and everything on the mountain being transfigured by the rising of the sun. And because the poet has this humility and this sense of gratitude, he is seeing this uh, transfiguration of the mountain by the light uh, of the sunrise 
that he is moved in wonder to contemplation and the dilation that leads to the writing of this beautiful poem. So uh, he talks about, uh, Hast thou a charm to stay the morning star in his steep course, so long he seems to pause on thy bald, awful head, O sovereign Blanc. So the mountain is a sovereign, it's like a king. It's, a, it's got a bald, awful head. Of course, it's so there's nothing grows. It's only snow up that high. Uh, it has such power that even um, uh, the morning star does not want to leave. It seems that the sun itself is waiting. Um, then we'll move on because there's only so much of this we can read. So let these lines, this is dilatatio par excellence. O dread and silent mount, I gazed upon thee till thou, still present to the bodily sense, didst vanish from my thought, entranced in prayer, I worshipped the invisible alone. So in seeing the beauty and the majesty of the mountain in the moment, uh, he's transfigured himself. Uh, so that he's entranced in prayer, worshipping the invisible, capital I, the God who grants him the presence of such beauty. And he even uses the phrase a few lines further down, to the dilating soul enwrapped, transfused into the mighty vision passing there as in her natural form, swelled vast to, to heaven. The dilating soul, the soul opens out so it's swell, swelling to the vastness of heaven itself into the presence of God. Awake, my soul, not only passive praise thou owest, not alone these swelling tears, mute thanks and secret ecstasy. Awake, voice of sweet song. Awake, my heart. Awake, green vows and icy cliffs. All join my him that he, the moment demands his not just passive response but his creative response he needs to sing a hymn of praise in thanksgiving for the glorious moment of beauty the kiss of beauty he's received and he's going to call upon the rest of creation to join him in the song and there's some questions who sank thy sunless pillars deep in earth? Who filled thy countenance with rosy light? Who made thee parent of perpetual streams? And you, ye five white torrents, fiercely glad, who called you forth? And who commanded? And the silence came. Here, let the billow stiffen and have rest. He's talking about the five torrents, the five rivers that flow down the side of the mountain that are now frozen. They're still. Who commanded the waters to be still? And then, then, then the praise begins. I'm going to read a part of it, and then we'll probably need to move on. Ye ice falls, motionless torrents, silent cataracts, who made you glorious as the gates of heaven beneath the keen full moon? Who bade the sun clothe you with rainbows? Who with living flowers of loveliest blue spread garlands at your feet? God, let the torrents like a shout of nations answer and let the ice plains echo God. God, sing ye meadow streams with gladsome voice, ye pine groves with your soft and soul-like sounds, and they too have a voice, yon piles of snow, and in their perilous fall shall thunder God. And I'll just read the concluding lines. Rise. O oh, ever rise, rise like a cloud of incense from the earth. Thou kingly spirit throned among the hills, thou dread ambassador from earth to heaven, great hierarch, tell thou the silent sky and tell the stars and tell yon rising sun, earth with her thousand voices, 
praises God. So that the mountain rises like a cloud of incense from the earth. You know, the incense in 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 the the sacred liturgy uh, rises uh, as a as a metaphor for our own prayer, for our own praise, for our own souls and prayers rising towards heaven. Well, the mountain um, rises towards heaven, and and we in looking up at the peak of the mountains and to the sunrise beyond, we are looking up to heaven. Uh, definition of prayer is lifting up the mind and heart to God. When we lift up the eyes to God in looking at the heights, that mountain peaks, sunrises and sunsets, we are joining the sunrise and the sunset and the mountains in praising the God that gave birth to them and to us. Here, I think now we've we've absolutely ascertained, without any doubt, the Christian spirit, the profoundly Christian spirit of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I would say, by the way, that I see him in some sense as paralleling G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton sometimes called himself G.K.C. Samuel Taylor Coleridge sometimes called himself STC. They parallel each other almost exactly. Um, so... Um, Coleridge was born in uh, 1772 and died in 1834. Uh, Cheston was born in 1874 and died in 1936. In other words, they lived for 62 years, exactly 102 years apart. So Coleridge, if you like, uh, uh, is uh, almost exactly a century before Cheston lives for exactly the same length of time. Uh, and they both served within their respective centuries as... as uh, a mountainous presence um, that is so influential upon what comes after. Coleridge, amongst other things, is a, uh, as well as being a great poet, is a great critic, particularly a critic of Shakespeare. Uh, and it's upon his formidable shoulders that the romantic presence in English culture in the first half of the 19th century rests and certainly uh, uh, um, a debt of gratitude and influences is uh, is is made manifest by Newman, amongst others, to his presence. So he serves the same catalytic role in the 19th century as Chesterton did in the 20th in some ways. Uh, he was a weaker character in some sense, however, not least because he fell uh, uh, prone to addiction, to opium. And that was in those days, by the way, it was, it was like people take aspirin today and the slightest thing wrong with you and they... They, they um, prescribed opium, uh, unaware of its addictive qualities, and Coleridge lived with opium addiction, which weakened him, and who knows what he might have achieved uh, had he not had that flaw in his character. However, he still achieved a great deal. Um, I want to read uh, this uh, translation of his, of, a ver of the Virgin's Cradle Hymn, uh, which was copied from a print of the Virgin in a Catholic village in Germany. I'm going to read the original in Latin, and then Coleridge's translation of it. Dormi Jesu, Marto videt, quae tan dulcem somnum videt, Dormi Jesu, blandulae, si non dormis Marta plorat, inter fila cantans orat, blande vani somnule. Sleep, sweet babe, my cares beguiling, Mother sits beside thee, smiling. Sleep, my darling, tenderly. If thou sleep not, mother mourneth. Singing at her will, she turneth. Come, soft slumber, balmily. And by the way, I'm, I'm also quoting from, from Poems Every Catholic Should Know, published by Tan Books, which I compiled. This is some of the selection from there. After that, I have a hymn before Sunrise Nevada Shamani, How Could I Not? I don't have um, the, uh, uh, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner because it is simply too long. The Virgin's Cradle Hymn follows. Then there's a, a poem called A Hymn, which I'm not going to read. Um, but the final three poems I am going to, to focus on in the, in the time we have left. I should have perhaps also mention, however, I mentioned Coleridge as a, as a critic of Shakespeare and as a, and as a, a Christian presence so he's also actually still a fairly particularly in the Anglican in Anglican circles uh, uh, 
um, an influence both in terms of his theology, his, his theological writings, uh, and his and his philosophical writings. Um, okay, so to nature, and this again is how does Romanticism meet Christianity? Well, perhaps in nature itself, we've seen it how. Uh, nature in terms of Mont Blanc uh, and the Alps uh, causes this hymn of praise. But here's a, a, a poem to nature. It may indeed be fantasy when I e essay to draw from all created things deep, heartfelt, inward joy that closely clings and trace in leaves and flowers that round me lie lessons of love and earnest piety. So let it be, and if the wide world rings in mock of this belief, it brings nor fear, nor grief, nor vain perplexity. So will I build my altar in the fields, and the blue sky my fretted dome shall be, and the sweet fragrance that the wild flower yields shall be the incense I will yield to thee. Thee, only God, and thou shalt not despise even me, the priest of this poor sacrifice. Now, it would be a grave error to believe that somehow this is pantheistic, that he's setting his altar in the fields. He's not worshipping nature, but the God of nature. But what he, what he is seeing is God as the creator, uh, the, the poet. And we should remember that the Greek word poesis means to make or to create. If God is the creator or the maker, he's also the poet. Um, that that's why um, oh, I'm following Boethius, who also is following Plato and uh, Pythagoras, seeing the cosmos as as uh, music, not in the audible sense, but in the sense that the whole of the cosmos is somehow uh, harmonious. Uh, it 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 um, sings forth uh, the music of God in the music of the spheres. Um, that 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 the, the natural mandana, that the music of the world, the music of the cosmos, the music of the spheres, that the very movement, the very order of 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 nature uh, is itself uh, music. That within us we have the musica humana. Uh, that we are made uh, in the image of God, and therefore we are actually uh, ourselves music. Although because we're fallen. We have brought discord into the harmony of the Imago Dei, the image of God yeah, in which we're made. Um, and, then there's, there's, and then there's Musica Instrumentalis, the incarnation of this beautiful harmony in incarnate forms, in, the, in, in a form that can be heard audibly through the ears. We only think of music as the final one of those, Musica Instrumentalis, but uh, it's a much deeper sense. So what Coleridge is doing here is seeing that deep music that order, that harmony, that beauty uh, in uh, God's poetry, that the fields, uh, the, uh, the flowers, the sunrise uh, is itself actually an altar uh, where God, if you like, pours himself forth to us, sh shining forth his beauty to us. And the only appropriate response by us to such pouring forth of him in creation is to give back to the giver of the gift the fruits of the gift given that's exactly what samuel taylor coleridge is getting at in this poem to nature and i'm going to read now my baptismal birthday god's child in christ adopted christ my all what that earth boasts were not lost cheaply rather than forfeit that blessed name by which I call the Holy One, the Almighty God, my Father. Father, in Christ we live, in, and Christ in thee, eternal thou and everlasting we. The heir of heaven, henceforth I fear not death, in Christ I live, in Christ I draw the breath of the true life. Let then earth, sea and sky make war against me, on my front I show their mighty master's seal. In vain they try to end my life that can but end its woe. Is that a deathbed where a Christian lies? Yes, but not his. Tis death itself 
that dies. So my baptismal birthday, what happens at baptism? That we die. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a symbolism uh, of, uh, of drowning in order to live, that we die in order to live. We bury the old self that we may live in Christ. There's a resurrection, but the resurrection is only possible because of the death that precedes it. And this resurrection transcends and triumphs over death itself. It's death itself that dies in the deathbed where a Christian lies. And I'm going to finish appropriately enough. A very few people write their own epitaph. It's sometimes said that Shakespeare wrote his because there's an epitaph on his grave in the first person. I don't believe for a moment Shakespeare wrote his own epitaph. I think someone penned those lines after he died. Um, but Coleridge did pen his own epitaph. Um, uh, I'm not sure with the spirit of whimsy. But uh, it's nonetheless very good and it would seem an appropriate place to end our discussion of Samuel Taylor Coleridge with an epitaph that he penned to himself. So we shall do that now. Epitaph by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Stop, Christian passerby. Stop, child of God. And read with gentle breast beneath this sod a poet lies, or that which once seemed he. O, oh, lift one thought in prayer to, for STC. That he, who many a year with toil of breath, found death in life, may here find life in death. Mercy for praise, to be forgiven for fame, he asked and hoped through Christ. Do thou the same. And on that hopeful note, um, we'll end this uh, episode of The Authority. Thanks, as always, for joining me. I'm Joseph Pierce. Please do join me next time. And until next time, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters, to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.